Hello, everybody. Welcome to Macro Money. This is Ilya Spivak, head of global macro here at Tasty Live. Welcome to the show. Today, we are going to take a step away from immediate event risk. We're going to step away from trying to figure out what next piece of data is going to come out and do X, Y, Z thing. And we're going to get a little bit thematic, as uh, we like to do here at Macro Money, when the opportunity presents itself, when the news flow slows just a bit, gives us that window. And we're going to ask, what's wrong with China's economy? It was easily the hope of hopes when we started the year uh, as it scrapped its zero COVID policies and started to reopen from, let's, uh, let's say, more stringent lockdowns than we've seen um, in um, most of the West and uh, the developed economies, certainly uh, longer lasting. Uh, and at this point, that hope is starting to look more like a headwind. And uh, the data coming out, the uh, indications uh, that that data implies seem to, to suggest that the recent focus on what's been happening in the U.S. and the sort of issues that we are having with the debt ceiling, with the Fed, and all of the various forms of uh, economic policy tightening that are implied therein, the issue, even if all those things are resolved favorably for, for markets, may end up being elsewhere entirely, and China all of a sudden looking like a major source of concern. So let's take a look at the data that's come out here uh, over the past week, what it means, and how it fits within this narrative. That, of course, will uh, tell us what it's likely to mean for market action. So fundamentally speaking, this is what is broken. So if you had to kind of capture it in a chart, this is really it. You can see there in uh, the tail end of last year, as we start December, there is where the reopening from zero COVID initially starts. So that's where you have the initial kind of first tidbits of headlines suggesting that China is going to change course on this. There's a bit of a tail there because, of course, economic data is delayed. So you don't get the response from economic data immediately because, of course, conditions on the ground are occurring in real time. But economic data takes a while to aggregate what's going on and to report on it. So what we're seeing here is a timeline of economic data releases rather than real time conditions on the ground, which, of course, we couldn't really know anyway unless we were physically there and everywhere in China all at the same time, needless to say, a mostly impossible task. So what we're looking at then is at which point does the reopening start to show up in the data? This is, of course, the City Economic Surprise Index, which uh, is a measure of economic data outcomes relative to forecasts. So when the data gets better than forecast, the index goes up. Worse, it goes down. Above zero, data is tending to surprise higher. Below zero, it's tending to surprise lower. Look at the surge that you get in mid-January. So that's the bottom, where the data starts to catch up with what's going on on the ground as you get the reopening in early December. Needless to say, there's a very clear surge. But then what happens in mid-April, and again, keep in mind, there's a lag here, the data starts to turn. What that suggests is maybe you're looking at about, give or take, a six-week lag if uh, the way into the 
reopening is any indication. So you go from early December to seeing the data start to capture momentum about six weeks later, five weeks later. If the data starts to turn, then in about mid-April, then perhaps as recently as March, the economy was already starting to flounder. Now, here's the data that's uh, come out just over the past week and a half or so. And this is the latest on this story. Notice, the trade balance came in with a slightly wider uh, surplus, but that's only because imports fell harder than exports slowed. So in other words, no particularly good news here. Exports slowed from uh, almost 15% to 8.5%, but imports fell harder. So down 7.9% uh, versus 1.4% in the March numbers. And so that's really why you got the trade balance higher. Not exactly an encouraging thing. Inflation uniformly lower. Uh, CPI down from 0 0.7 to 0 0.1. PPI increasingly uh, negative from uh, two and a half to 3.6 percent on the downside. Looking at financing, overall loans significantly smaller, down from 5.4 uh, to 1.2 trillion yuan. New loans down even more aggressively from 3.9 to less than 1 trillion yuan about 720 billion. Seemingly a bit of a better story on industrial production and retail sales because both seem to have accelerated month to month. So the year on year rate seemed to increase from March to April. But as we'll uh, see in just a moment here, that's not all that meets the eye there. Uh, there's actually a bit more of a scary underpinning to those numbers. And then, of course, uh, capital investment slowing, growing 4.7 uh, down from 5.1%. So the overwhelming thrust of this data is that something in China's economy is fundamentally looking weak and is weakening over time. Consider what's going on with China's share of global trade turnover since the trade numbers were the first things that we looked at here. And what we'll do is we'll go in order. We'll first look at the trade picture, then inflation and financing, then industrial production and retail sales, and then tie it all together as to why it's all occurring. So here is the trade side. You can see that looking from where China's share of global turnover was going into COVID and immediately thereafter, and now there's been a significant reduction. So China has gone from 13 to 10 percent of global imports. That means a weakening uh, internal demand story and a m less pronounced role in intermediate goods um, dynamics. Similarly, for exports, that's less demand for China's finished products and also, again, a diminished role in intermediate goods supply chains, all of which suggests that its role in global commerce is being reduced. You can see it in spades here as we look at the overall share uh, of China as a part of global trade going down from where COVID starts, uh, just on the way out of it, as a matter of fact, from about mid of 2020 through to now, down from 15 to 12 and a half percent. And you can see that as global trade has slowed, so too, we've seen a slowdown in trade in China, uh, the dark line there uh, in the red, the year on year rates there, but notice the dramatic difference in, in momentum. Global trade is down 1.5% off the peak 
but trade in China down almost 15%. So we're looking at a very meaningful downturn in both the amount of trade flowing into China to feed domestic demand there and a loss of demand for its wares externally at the same time as supply chains that use China as a way station for intermediate goods seem to have shifted to use China less. And of course, the lockdowns are a part of that. Geopolitical tensions are perhaps a part of that. But altogether, it seems like China is fading as a driver of global commercial dynamics. Now, on to the inflation side of things. Consider here that inflation in China has been sinking. It's been sinking uh, w whether we take the all-important uh, measure of food prices, which is a major input into uh, the CPI basket. China doesn't reveal the exact makeup of its CPI basket, but food seems to account for, for uh, about a quarter, uh, which is a very large percentage for a single thing. Uh, housing is about another quarter uh, uh, or a fifth when we look at um, estimates for this. Uh, the most, uh, I would say, uh, complete one seems to come from Bloomberg. What we see here then is overall CPI dramatically lower, just 0.1%. Compare that with the runaway inflation we still see in much of the developed world. Uh, this, of course, is not good news. There's a reason that most central banks aim for slightly positive inflation in the 1% to 3% range, give or take. At 0.1, what this speaks to is a significant slowdown in demand that CPI excluding food is at similar levels and that indeed food inflation is at similar levels suggests that this isn't just about China's growth engine. This isn't just about imported uh, costs. This seems to be a story about weak domestic demand. In fact, uh, we have here the B Bloomberg Commodity uh, Index sub-measures of energy and softs to essentially uh, consider the inputs that tend to be biggest into Chinese CPI, energy and food, softs being a proxy for food. And we can see that even with softs starting to bottom, and moving a bit higher over the past three months or so, we still are looking at food inflation that's falling. That would suggest that indeed there is a weakening of domestic demand. Now, of course, uh, I've uh, lagged CPI here by four months in all of its forms, the food one, the CPI excluding food, and the overall, so that it lines up with these commodity prices, uh, there is, of course, a lag in the data reporting versus real market conditions, for obvious reasons. Uh, but it is important to consider that going forward, energy prices have continued to fall and uh, softs have continued to rise. So if in fact there is some sort of a bid up to inflation there, it would come against the backdrop of weakening domestic demand and therefore end up as stagflation, not necessarily something that is good news, not the kind of inflation that would speak to growth, rather the kind of inflation that would be important. So. That's something to uh, keep an eye on here going forward, suggesting that as bad as this looks, it could get worse. And then, of course, on the financing side of things, what we see is after a surge at the reopening, notice the bottom uh, there on total loans in December a surge right after the reopening into February and subsequently 
a plunge back into the range. So what we see is that there is a pickup in financing as the economy reopens, but it would appear that we've already lost that momentum. Now, if the economy were doing well, there should be a pickup in financing because uh, a swell in economic activity ostensibly should be uh, consistent with businesses taking out more credit to participate and to grow. That is pointedly not what we're seeing here. So there was a bit of a bump, um, and that bump has fizzled already. What's in, uh, in particular uh, interesting about this is that if we compare total loans to new loans, which is the dotted line there, new loans never really got off the ground. So what this looks like is perhaps capital being deployed to enable the reopening rather than new growth being financed, expansion being uh, financed. And that is, again, not a positive story about the prospects for the economy going forward. If capital is not going to new ventures, to expansion, to growth, well, then that growth and expansion won't occur. We see, as a matter of fact, looking at the implied policy curve, both the current and um, a week ago, um, that's in the dotted line uh, in small dots, are meaningfully lower than the curve as it stood at the reopening at the start of December. In other words, what the markets are saying here is that there is likely to be a more dovish view on policy than when the reopening began. That's hardly a story of growth. That's a story of monetary policy needing to support an economy on life support, which is not what you might expect in a situation where you've taken away the barriers uh, to growth and said, the economy is open, go forth and grow. Clearly, that isn't what the markets see, and they're reckoning for where Chinese monetary policy then has to go to manage the current situation is that it actually has needed to become more dovish since the reopening occurred, not less. Now, uh, I mentioned that the industrial production and the retail sales numbers l look somewhat more supportive at the headline. We can see here, once again, the industrial production number went from 3.9 to 5.6. The retail sales number went from 10.6 to 18.4. That looks supportive at face value. Until, of course, you look at how that worked out relative to forecasts. So here we have industrial production uh, in the red, retail sales in the dark blue. Uh, the solid lines are actual results. The dotted are forecasts. So consider that in particular for retail sales, 21.9 expected, 18.4 realized. Industrial production scarier still, 10.9 expected, 5.6 realized. So these numbers were substantially weaker than the markets anticipated, in particular, weaker on the external side of the equation, the part of the equation that deals with uh, China's ability to glean growth from its export engine. That is very clearly not occurring here. That intermediate goods trade part of the story does not seem to be where the growth is coming from. In fact, as we start the reopening, you can see retail sales starts to grow much faster than does industrial production. In fact, industrial production never really climbs out of its range that it's held since about uh, the, uh, let's call it, 
middle of 2021. So it really hasn't moved out of its range in two years, despite the reopening, even though there's been a bit of a, a pickup within that range, much of the vigor has come domestically, ostensibly because you've reopened the economy. And so people that were locked down have come out. And so now the question is necessarily, well, can domestic demand power activity? And looking at the extent to which China is dependent on the trade sector, which is about 40 percent of, um, of overall GDP accounted for by um, cumulative trade flows, it looks like the answer is no. It, it, it looks like the absence of a vibrant external sector, which is still the main driver of growth is really starting to hamper things while the dividend from the reopening and the initial burst of strength there seems to be fading. PMI numbers confirm the story. Have a look here at uh, the official set of figures uh, here. The initial burst of strength you see comes from services, which is primarily a domestic demand sort of story. And you can see that's uh, also the driver for the composite index going up. But manufacturing, much more subdued. And indeed, after a recent turn here in the April numbers where everything seems to have started to decline, manufacturing is back under that 50 boom bust line, which is telling us that at this point, the manufacturing sector is actually contracting whereas services has seemingly peaked and is growing at a slower rate, which is giving us a slowdown in the overall economy, the composite, in tandem. And that's official numbers. If you look at the numbers for the private sector uh, estimate, this is um, from Kaishin and S&P Global, much the same story, uh, still the recovery powered mostly domestically uh, by services. You can see that's the surge, the composite follows. We get a brief, brief uptick above 50 on the manufacturing side, and we're back under 50 now. So the story really seems to be about the pickup and growth that we've seen in China has been about reopening and letting domestic consumers back out into the world to engage in economic activity. But the external sector remains missing, even as it remains the main catalyst for continued momentum. And so to the extent that the dividend from reopening for domestic demand runs its course, the next step, ostensibly already underway, if these reversals in PMI find follow through, going forward, we have a very troubled story. Now, why is all of, all of this occurring? Why is um, the disappointment here so acute? Well, let's look at some regional comparisons. Note, the U.S. and Europe are well into catch-up mode, having um, bottomed in the COVID recession at a time when China is still very much deteriorating. So the peak in the U.S. reacceleration, these are composite PMI numbers, so they speak to uh, manufacturing and service sector growth taken collectively uh, on a weighted basis, of course, because um, in both the Eurozone and the U.S., manufacturing is a much smaller part of the overall pie than our services. By May, U.S. growth has already surged back and is already cooling as stimulus impact starts to wane. You get something similar just a few months later 
in July of 2021 in Europe. And you can see because the U.S. spent much more on stimulus as a share of GDP than did Europe, the upswell in the U.S. is much more aggressive and the uh, bounce in, in growth follows. Similarly, in Europe, uh, there is, of course, a bounce, but it's a bit shallower because they spent less money on stimulus to offset lockdowns and such. But you can see that already from July 2021, demand from China's main export markets is already on the wane. Things are already slowing. Whereas China doesn't reopen until December of 2022. By the time it reopens, its main markets are already around the corner from the most aggressive growth phase and starting to head the other way. And of course, the reason for that is all of that growth generated a tremendous amount of inflation and triggered monetary tightening. So you can see by March of 2022, global growth has already peaked because Fed rates bottomed the previous month, and by March, they're already going up. So the Fed is already exerting slowing pressure on the economy. It is already starting to bring global demand lower as a consequence of its very aggressive policy tightening. And we've talked about this before, of course, other central banks joined the Fed eventually, but it really is the Fed that matters most because what it's doing is increasing the cost of borrowing dollars, the quintessential medium of global exchange, which means that when the Fed increases the cost of borrowing dollars, it increases the cost of financing economic activity writ large. So borrowing costs go up everywhere, not just in the U.S., with the possible exception of economies completely disconnected from the global commercial system like, say, North Korea. So that aside, we can clearly see that the Fed's actions are slowing growth and are likely to continue to slow it as rates continue to creep higher. And so we have a situation here where that starts to occur and slow momentum everywhere as you can see here from um, the direction of travel from the peaks in um, U.S. and Eurozone PMI numbers well before China decides to come and tap that demand or hope to as it reopens. But, but of course, by then, that demand is already receding because the Fed is already well into its tightening cycle. By the time China started to reopen, the Fed had already raised rates by close to 400 basis points. So the rebound in China, while you can certainly see it there from December to March, much shallower. Not nearly the dramatic surge that we saw in Europe or the U.S., and much shorter lived. You can see the petering out of domestic demand in the meanwhile when you look at metro, uh, metro activity in the top five cities in China as a kind of benchmark for people have left lockdowns and are now out and about and engaging with life in a more normal way. Notice here, um, this is uh, metro traffic for the top five cities averaged and then uh, what i'm looking at here is the 20-day moving average of that average to kind of get away from some of the more aggressive volatility in these numbers notice where we are currently so here is the current setting here's where we were before COVID. we've essentially returned to where this activity was before COVID struck which was right here so in essence, what we have is perhaps the reopening dividend spent, the boost to domestic demand over.
the external sector, again, the most important thing. And as that occurs, growth fizzling, because that external sector is just not what some of these hopeful expectations might have surmised because of this. Because even as global trade declines, the situation in China declines much harder and China's share of global demand fades. All of which speaks to a very troubling situation for the global economy as a whole. Because here, again, we're looking at the world's second largest economy. Which, if it were to have a significant downturn, would amount to a meaningful headwind for global demand and global economic activity well outside of anything that might be happening in the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, with the U.S. debt ceiling, et cetera, et cetera. And that is macro money for today. Thank you very much for joining me. As ever, I am here Monday through Thursday, right after overtime with friend of the show, Chris Vecchio, head of Futures and Forex here at Tasty Live, where Chris and I break down the day's developments and try to make sense of what's going on from a variety of perspectives, macro, tactical, technical, fundamental. Um, I'm also on with Chris for Futures Power Hour on Fridays and on with Tom and Tony for First Call on Sundays. Outside of those shows, I am opining on Twitter at Ilya Spivak. Good luck trading out there, everybody. See you tomorrow. Take care.